Hello and welcome to the India Hangout on this bright Monday afternoon. The Modi Governance Challenge, how will he deliver it? What will be the role of technology and what are the kind of examples we can look at to understand how it could go, where it could go and can it scale up? My co-anchor, Ayaz Memon. Thanks, Ayaz, good. what are the challenges ahead? Technology will play a key role, we know that. But before we get into it, how do you see it? The use of technology was evident in the campaign trail itself. Exactly, you know, the yeah. amount of technology he has used. And I think he has made no bones of the fact that yeah. Technology is going to be a big driver in how this country evolves or develops from here. So, I mean, the million dollar question is how far and how well he will use it and what all will be the tools that he's planning to use. Right. As of now, as we talk, we're still in suspense about the ministry itself, the cabinet. Right. Uh, the names are there, but the portfolio is yet to be decided. So, yeah. but, uh, you know, I think that uh, the way he ran Gujarat, so while he's hands on, I think he, he wants all the buttons and the levers with him. Yeah. But technology to be the great kind of conduit. That's a very good point. So the technology is important, but so is the, the controls to the technology or the yeah. buttons as you call it. Sanjay Jaju, IT Secretary of uh, Andhra Pradesh joins us. Uh, uh, very good afternoon to you, Sanjay. So uh, what we want to try and understand is, uh, tell us of course a little more about uh, your own e-governance effort, uh, potentially the largest in the world. Uh, uh, it's called MeSeva. And also what we are trying to understand is, how can this be scaled up? if governance and governance driven by technology is a way to go forward for India. Yeah, thanks Govin. The, uh, let me first come to the initiative that we ran in, in this state. Uh, you've mentioned that it's arguably the world's biggest e-governance initiative. And uh, this project, Mi Seva, uh, as the word stands, means uh, Aapki Seva, that is at your service in Telugu. And what we have tried to do is, as part of this project, broken the departmental silos brought the departments together and made technology become the integrator. We more than 350 services pertaining to government departments. These are kind of G2C and the G2B services are being delivered through this platform. And uh, on the one hand, we give all these services through, uh, through the internet on our, on our website. But at the same time, for those who do not have access to internet, we provide them uh, these services through the common kiosk. We call them Seva centers, which are being done right. by local entrepreneurs. And uh, to, a, to a large extent, this has also become a harbinger for uh, ensuring democracy, the digital democracy at, uh, at local levels. And uh, we expect these centers to double up as digital knowledge centers in future. Coming to the replication part, uh, uh, Sanjay, Sanjay, can I interrupt you for a second? So, can you give us an example of a few services, particularly your most popular services, and how citizens in uh, Andhra Pradesh are using them and perhaps benefiting? See, out of 350 services, uh, the bulk of the services pertain, pertain to the revenue department. Revenue department is basically the first tier of administration, which is at the uh, uh, local level, uh, district collectors, and uh, we call them bundles here, and uh, the administration below district. And for example, land records, which is a, a fundamental information which citizens require for taking up agricultural activities or uh, you know, getting agricultural loans. So this is one of our killer services, if I may use that word. And uh, people are able to get the copies of their land records and their entitlements online through these kiosks. And this, to a very large extent, has benefited them from kind of uh, multiple visits. So what about transactions? I mean, uh, you know, receiving money, per subsidies, benefits, and so on? Uh, as far as Miseva, although we use technology, as far as the state government is concerned, we make use of technology in most of the other government programs as well, when we do some real tan tangible efforts. But when it comes to Miseva, Miseva is about the intangible work, the regulatory administration, the, uh, the kind of services where you give permits and permissions and documents and proceedings. I mean, these are the kind of uh, kind of things which, as a state, we have ordained people to get. I mean, we've told people to get birth certificates, driving licenses. So, MiSeva actually looks into these intangible services which the state delivers, and uh, 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 all the 350 services pertain to that particular category. And uh, how many services, uh, uh, actually, amongst the services, how many transactions of these services have you done so far since MiSeva has been? Uh, uh, start, set up and uh, what is the kind of run rate that you're seeing today? See, it's about uh, a year and a half since we stabilized MeSeva in terms of the outreach, in terms of uh, opening up centers all across the state and in, in bringing together all these services. I mean, we've uh, 
in in this year one and a half years time one and a half years time we have so far completed the uh, four and a half crore transactions and four and a half crore transactions uh, uh, essentially pertain to all these 350 services although we do another 10 crore transactions which pertain to the the payment of electricity bills and uh, utility bills and uh, other stuff which uh, which also helps citizen to a large extent but in terms of the me seva core services we do on an approximate basis about 3 crore transactions in a year 3 crore citizen and business transactions a year so uh, so what are the services where there has been a large emphasis from the users what is it that they are really asking for because that could be like a almost like a prototype or a sample for the rest of the country yeah i mean uh, that's where i was talking about the replication part i mean to a very large extent all these services are the services which are uh, which are demand based i mean these are demanded by the citizens and uh, and that's how the identification process begin when we began the identification process we were looking at those services which have a uh, huge citizen interface and lot of demand from the from the citizen and we also looked at those services where you have uh, you know a uh, lot of corruption and red tape and uh, so when and the process of identification began we were first looking at those services which can have large number of transactions and that's where these kind of land record services or uh, the municipality services or uh, the revenue department services these permissions and permits and uh, that process started but later when we realized that uh, this model is proving to be very successful then we moved it to a large extent and then we finally brought in a uh, few government to business related services you would be surprised that you know in our state all the mining leases and permissions are being given through the mis seva system all the industrial department permissions are being given through this system so we started with the g2c kind of services but then later on we moved it to uh, the g2b services and now it's it's a completely integrated platform uh, one stop shop for all the activities which citizen and business Right. Uh, does it comment S- sanjay what's the biggest pain point that you feel you've removed from uh, the citizens life uh, uh, the, the citizen that's been interacting with you in your state see if, if you if you look at the project of this nature i mean now in delhi they're talking in terms of you know integrating ministries and uh, you know the biggest problem is as somebody rightly pointed out that governance has kind of uh, become correspondence in this country i mean uh what we what we what we call off as government is basically what's happening is correspondence move from one department to another and in many such cases what we have tried to do and what we do in, in government is actually make the citizen become the purveyor of that information i mean a, a citizen requires a birth certificate because the school where he has to get an admission for his ward require that certificate so what actually happens is goes to one department collects that certificate goes to another department carries that certificate and hands it over to that department so what we have tried to do is to bring in this integration citizen is not aware of these departmental silos he only knows one monolithic frame called government so uh, technology can play a, a huge role why can the databases not talk to each other why should citizen become a purveyor of this information i think that was a guiding philosophy philosophy right so the biggest pain was how to break these silos yeah. because you know every department would like to hold on to hold on to the turf that they have and that's where you know uh, the vested interests i call them the lobby brigade and uh, you know how to cut that was the was the biggest challenge that we had in the project and technology and, is in right so uh, sanjay we are obviously going to come uh, very shortly to what this what it would take to scale this up to a national level i mean of course many states have uh, e governance programs too but yours is uh, different and has some uh, some uh, some amount of a head start uh, but tell us uh, in terms of tra- uh, actual transactions done you said that uh, you know you've got over 4 uh, crore uh, transactions that have happened I have have all of these been fulfilled and what's the fulfillment ratio yeah so uh, that's a good question in me seva we were uh, when we started the conceptualization of this project the first part that we wanted to figure out was how many of these services can be delivered online across the counter that means the citizen comes makes a request and he, he gets his service online without uh, that service to be routed to the department workflow and we realize that at least one third of the services and the one third of the transactions that we do can actually be converted into a kind of across the counter services this was possible for example look at land records now earlier the citizen had to go to a tehsildar's office make a request for land records tehsildar will give him some 7 days time or stuff like that and then uh, tehsildar will look at his records make that land record copy and after 7 days sign it with his signature in an ink and hand it over to the citizen so now to monitor all this always become the huge challenge even though we may have certain citizen charter time limits and stuff like that 
what we have tried to do is some of those seemingly workflow based services have been now converted into a online system by integrating all these databases and making these databases sign by in bulk in bulk in advance by the concerned functionaries so what effectively happens is it becomes a download so when a citizen now goes and approaches the vc of our center for land records those records are already signed in bulk by the concerned functionaries so he just needs to go and give some of the details of the survey numbers and stuff like that and he's able to get a print out right. which is digitally signed by the concerned functionary so one third of these services are are this variety while the rest of them where there is some mandatory requirement of, of uh, an inspection or an inquiry we have fixed clear citizen charter time limits that that means for example a service which needs to be delivered in 15 days and we understand that the process also requires 15 days we've set the time for 15 days some services have 30 days some services have even 7 days so what effectively happens is with this kind of these kind of time limits uh, uh, then we look at the adherence of uh, the delivery system to those time limits and those things are being monitored very closely you would be very happy to note that out of four and a half crore transactions that we have done the across the counter variety is one third which is about a crore and a half while the rest of the three crore transactions the current numbers which have gone beyond the slas are just about 3 and a half lakhs so that is the kind of uh, uh, so you're assurance. saying 3 and a half lakh transactions have not been completed that's that's what you're saying right yeah they have gone beyond the citizen charter time limits out of the 3 crore transactions that we have done uh, in this particular category okay yeah so as i gather one thing is that there is increased transparency obviously because of the use of technology it also means that there is you know less need for uh maybe government servants so to speak to just move files around but are there any obvious pitfalls that people need to guard against see the first pitfall would be that we have to all understand that technology is only an enabler what you need is a, a system wherein there is political and administrative will to adapt and adopt technology now we have created this system now tomorrow let's say for example uh the successors decide that look technology is there but i'm not going to make use of all these tables i'm not going to even monitor the disposal of these applications and the whole system whole system may fall flat so i won't i won't call it the failure of the technology it would be more of failure of the implementation process so these kind of processes do require constant political and administrative will to address grievances which come in through this system and at the same time you also need to understand that technology is changing very fast it's a very dynamic uh, situation now i mean you have now in the country uh, mobile phones which actually have uh, transformed the way we used to look at digital literacy you have people wielding whatsapp you have uh, you know even those who were not dig- dig- digitally connected say about a year and a half back they all look digitally connected now so possibly we need to look at so- at solutions wherein we move these platforms into the emerging platform that are coming in and i think that's where we will need to have uh, a strong focus on constant updation of uh, such projects over a period of time right so sajay uh, okay now let's uh, let's take this to the next level uh, you know and and that's the subject that we're trying to uh, deal with today as well if this were i mean if we were to i mean there is a larger uh, governance challenge in this country uh, uh, the the new government that's come in has obviously ridden on the plank of governance to deliver that technology will play a role but now we are talking about a national integrated approach to this i mean of course there have been some national integrated approaches but we are talking about doing something at a much larger scale than ever uh, that's ever been done is that going to be simple or feasible or as feasible as we think it is see uh, as far as as far as gov- governments are concerned uh, you know the the whole process of government is broken up into uh, different tiers in our in our country people do not appreciate it for example you may you may like to blame your member of parliament for the road not laid in front of your house but the fact is that road is not laid by the central government that road is laid by by the local municipal corporation or the gram panchayat so you have actually three tiers you have the local governments you have the state government and you have the national government now if we look at all the three forms of government uh, the first thing we will need to understand is the, the very purpose of of the of, of gafa government department is broadly to cater to some citizen need now it may be a very tangible citizen need like drinking water supply or a road in front of a house or it may be a, an absolutely intangible kind of a thing for the citizen you know take care of the defenses of the country so the the whole process has to be possibly divided into uh, into these compartments which are those departments which have 
citizen interface or business interface and uh, they may be at the central level, they may be at the state level, they may be at the local level. And how do we make use of technology to improve that interface? And I think to my mind, uh, we may talk of uh, you know trying to improve this interface by putting in some citizen charter, time limits, and displaying some boards and RTI and stuff like that, but that won't happen. Unless we make use of technology, uh, A, we will not be able to quantify where the breaks are, where the bottlenecks are, and B, technology is the most cost-effective method of trying to improve this interface. Right. So, one, so, uh, so, so my whole approach would be that uh, at all these levels, what would be required is to identify all the touch points where the interface is and, and weave in technology. At the same time, try and understand where we can do away with those transactions. See, the real situation would be as far as regulatory administration when if you have a situation where you don't need to have a driving license, it's all available online somewhere, and a citizen need not copy of that driving license with him. Technically, that's the ideal situation. But because we have ordained that these are the things which a citizen needs to possess, so we need to identify all those touch points, do away with all those points where uh, uh, possibly technology can integrate various departments together. And wherever we cannot do all that, then try and make use of technology to ensure that citizen Need not okay, that's, a, no, no, uh, that's a general point and I take that. Okay, let me, uh, before I kind of uh, come back with let, a few questions which have come in. So the first one is uh, from Samir, he asks, uh, what efforts are taken to institutionalize the use of technology so that the use of technology remains even with government or uh, chief minister, prime minister changes, which is political changes. And there's another question from Shruti, she says, what role can public-private partnerships play in this area? Yeah, I mean, very important. I mean, the first part is we may do projects of this nature, but the fact of the matter is that these projects have to be sustained beyond the life of the incumbent, somebody like us, or beyond the life of the governments. And I think to that extent, what we need to do is that allow these projects to develop critical mass. And for example, our, our uh, as when we were developing the MiSeva project, our principal premise used to be that by the time we leave this project, this project should have sufficient critical mass where it cannot be undone. And I think that also happens through public-private partnerships. So these two questions are actually related. For example, in the MiSeva process, although we've, we've used a lot of private companies which have developed the software and the, and the applications for the MiSeva, but all the kiosks that we have in the state, more than 7,500 kiosks, uh, the MiSeva center that we run in the state, they're not run by the state. They're not even owned by the state. They're all owned by private individuals which agglomerate through a, a company. And all these individuals uh, are eking out their livelihood through these centers. And of course, they are competing with each other because you know services can be delivered from anywhere to anywhere. So these are the kind, these are the people who would always be, uh, you know, provide a, provide a critical mass, a, a kind of an interest in, in the project and in the future of the project. So uh, that's one. And secondly, we, we in our state, we have also created an institutional structure in the form of a, a directorate for e-governance services. I mean, these uh, this directorate's core mandate is to bring in many, as many services as possible into the into the ESD framework. And thirdly, the legal part. In our state, we have passed the electronic service delivery rules through the legislature, which actually mandates that every government department within three years of those, that act being passed. The central, uh, there's a central act as well, which is coming on that, right? Is that is that uh, how does that will that run concurrently or will it supersede? Yeah, I mean, the Central Act is, is will, will work, work two ways. A, I think Central Act would apply to all the Central Government ministries. Okay. That all those ministries have citizen points, they will have to do that. And possibly the same act can also become a model act for the state assemblies to adopt for their respective state services and maybe even the local body services. Okay. So, so they're useful. It may be the, be the legal foundation for, uh, for what, what we're talking right now. Right. So as I understand it, the two biggest uh, requirements are one is to institutionalize the process so that, you know, it, it stays on, it doesn't go with the incumbent, you don't revert back to the old situation again. The other is that obviously you need to keep a tab on, uh, you know, uh, how technology evolves because you don't want, you know, to be left behind where the technology is concerned. Yeah, in, uh, and the technology is changing very fast. I mean, it's, it's changing much more faster than what we've, how the governments change. So it's, it's important that uh, uh, we are very dynamic in that, and that's where the role of the private sector becomes important. I mean, when we develop this project, uh, uh, even for services development, we have used uh, the latest technologies, and uh, it's not as if we have some in-house team which develops all these codes and, and softwares. 
So make use of the latest technology and of course Department of Information Technology from Government of India has already laid out certain instructions and guidelines for the development of softwares and uh, issues of interoperability of those softwares, issues of uh, making use of open, soft, open source and uh, uh, you know, open standards mainly so that uh, we don't get into a situation where we get vendor logged and uh, we are not able to update our systems. So, so Sanjay, tell us, you know, uh, two questions again. One is a policy question and one is a execution question. If we were to, uh, I mean, there are many states which obviously have similar efforts, right, or at varying levels and varying degrees of reach. Now, if, if there has to be a more nationally integrated uh, uh, model of uh, governance or e-governance delivery, which fits with what the incoming government has been in some ways promising to do, what would it take? Because you know, this is 30 states and only only a few states or a handful of states literally have got uh, the kind of backbone and the digitization the way you've got. Yeah, it would require multiple steps it, uh, and some, some of those steps have already been taken. For example, there is a national e-governance plan which is in place, which has uh, provided sufficient budgets to the states in terms of setting up the state data centers or creating the statewide area networks. and. Uh, even the common service center program, which actually sets apart some money for setting up these kiosks. But unfortunately, what, what happens at the state level? Now, before NISEVA started, we had all these three initiatives. And uh, 2007, we started those initiatives. And we had the state data center. We had the statewide area network. And uh, state data center was not even utilized to an extent of 1%. Because when you have no services, obviously, you don't have servers to put in. So what do you do with that? The statewide area network were not even utilized to the extent of 10%, except for some routine video conferences and some interneting. I don't think people were even making use of it because there are hardly any applications running on it. Coming to the common service centers, we set up common service centers from 2000 in, in the year 2007, and by 2010, for want of services, for, uh, because departments didn't give uh, mandate to start any services, uh, everybody was languishing, and by, by 2010, we had absolutely no nothing. But when we started the MISEVA initiative, we realized that we need to work on under, under this backdrop. We already have this infrastructure available. How do we make use of this infrastructure? Sanjay, yeah, so Sanjay, there's a question here which perhaps preempts what you're saying. Uh, so Samir again asks, uh, do you suggest a ministry for e-governance at the center? What will your recipe be for a new government? No, there's already a ministry. For example, there's a ministry of, for information technology in, uh, and electronics, uh, which is known as DIT in the government of India. There's already a ministry. Obviously, that ministry can uh, play a huge role in among the central ministries to try and you know get them on board. Because there are a lot of central ministries which are huge citizen interface or business interface. For example, you can have a, the can a central level ministry even uh, uh, more invigorated than perhaps what it was before push this through uh, a, a, a sort of federated structure like you know federated structure like India with you know because it appears to me that states where uh, this has taken off is really because the states have taken the initiative not because someone from the center has been pushing. Right? Also go in the would it lead to state center conflicts because there are certain things that the states want you know in the kind yeah. of structure that we have is there a possibility of that and would a integrated approach stay controlled by the center work in the federal system like ours. Anjay? No, there, there are two things here. Uh, yes, in, in a federal system, uh, there is a, a thin line which separates, you know, encroachment of spaces. So we, we need to be very uh, cautious about that. I mean, central government cannot mandate uh, state governments to do a particular thing, especially if it is falling in a concurrent list. And uh, some of these services possibly fall even in the state list. But now what is important is even at the central government level. I'll just give you a small example. There's a project called eBiz, which was supposed to be a, an online initiative which was supposed to be providing single window clearances to businesses. And you know how pathetic our situation is in terms of, you know, the World Bank's doing business index. I think we've, we rank somewhere, uh, somewhere in the, possibly in the last, last, last ranks of in, in international level. And you'd be surprised that even many of the central ministries, which were part of that particular project, are supposed to be giving, say, environmental clearance or supposed to be giving uh, industrial exemptions or uh, you know there are a lot of the central subjects which are involved obviously there are some state subjects also involved when an industry has to be set up and to your surprise you will know that there was resistance from many departments even to join that small integrated window so I think what's important is for somebody to break these departments departmental silos and 
enough them to make use of technology and why should they be uh, holding on to their turf when technology can provide a provide a medium of exchange between the departments at the same time then you have a lot of state government departments which are involved for example if you have to set up a business a technology can be easily made use of another part is not just you know creating a software and 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 you know putting up a portal what's important and that's the and we were quite uh, uh, you know mindful of this particular fact when we did me seva project is the capacity building part i mean do i mean you have a whole set of bureaucracy at all levels these in, these people have uh, varying levels of uh, capabilities in especially it skills so we when we run these projects we have to be uh, running a parallel program to train these functionaries and hone their it skills so that it doesn't come as a surprise to them for example in me seva you be uh, this again a very happy situation nothing in me seva is done without a digital signature we don't make use of ink signature in this project at all all our 350 services all our functionaries tehsildars or police inspectors or municipal commissioners or sub registrars you you call them they are all of them make use of digital signatures it was a herculean effort to number one provide them the digital signature then train them to how to how they operate their digital signature then also train them on on the whole functionality of the project so i think it has to be looked at in a very very holistic sense i agree that central government can can do only uh, only so much as far as the state governments are concerned but to an extent uh, even the central ministries need to be properly integrated when we when we look at uh, the common interface and possibly technology provides that interface so uh, uh, sanjay so once you have digital signatures and you you did say that there is a, it takes time to ensure that every uh, layer of the administration gets those digital signatures does the system ensure in some ways that people have to sign off in a certain time and if they don't there's a flag being thrown up absolutely i mean uh, you know many states have these electronic service delivery acts i mean where they are actually mandated that if a particular service is not delivered within that time limit uh, penalties can be imposed on the concerned uh, defaulting officer and i don't know you in the media you can find out uh, what are the kind of penalties which might have been imposed absolutely nothing in comparison to the promises which were made in those acts because you just don't know without technology everybody would say that you know look i received this application today and i've done it in 15 days so people will people will not even take cognizance of the application that might be lying on their table but in technology in in, in a situation like this it's impossible because it's, it's timed by the computer and the day you sign it is also timed by the computer because your digital signature is being used and that's exactly the reason why we wanted to make use of the digital signature so that we can really quantify and then reward good performance and punish the offending parties and uh, this is not have you actually to... actually find people within the government or have actually people been uh, have had people uh, been forced to pay or have they actually cuffed up penalties government uh, officials no we for example in our, what i what i was referring to was certain acts which are there in other states that they have electronic not electronic act but they call them public yeah, public service guarantee acts or some such such things wherein they say actually that you know if a particular service is not delivered within a time limit then they assess that time limit and based on that certain penalties are imposed what i am saying is they have not integrated technology in many of those uh, acts and that's exactly the reason why those those fines are nothing it was in your really case in andhra's case for instance are you able to do that no in our case we have not gone in for for the penalty okay. system so far okay. we have only gone for making use of technology to figure out where the lapses are and then we make use of technology to to reward good performance i mean we have every two months we used to have we conduct these seva awards where we felicitate uh, good functionaries but i think our larger vision was that you know we will now bring in an act which would also impose certain penalties on those of uh, not conforming to the guidelines and, and the time limit set right so i have one uh, you know i think a crucial question to ask how resistant are people to change what did it take to convince people that e governance is the way to go including on, in the babu dam you know uh, people are reluctant to change they think that they might lose their only source of uh, control or power or you know livelihood or whatever it might be see to to start with there would be always these uh, you know doubting promises they will always uh, they always know that you know it's it's going to I mean lot of people used to in fact call call our department as are you information technology or intrusion technology i mean why are you not allowing us to work and uh, uh, it, it it used to be uh, you know the 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 backing from the top the political will at the top which used to make departments come to us and once you have uh, that backing and once you are able to show them the uh, you know the process 
then gradually what happens is uh, the, the detractors fall into place. I'll also give you a small example. You also need to strategize when you develop services. For example, certain departments, uh, when we used to start the development of services, we used to look at certain softer services, I mean the low-hanging fruit, where we knew that you know it's more of a headache for the department rather than the vested interest part. So when you start with some of those services and when you prove your point, then it becomes much easier for you to take on the, the higher level services. And you know, to be your surprise, initially, for example, many of the revenue associations and all, they were up in arms, arms against us as if we were trying to encroach on their, on, their, on their rights. And we actually wanted to tell them that, look, you're not doing that. The, right. As far as the designated officer is concerned, it still remains the same. Only thing is, he was doing it uh, through a manual system. Now we have provided a platform, and that platform is going to help him do his work. Sanjay, we've and now if almost you look run out of time. time. Uh, Sanjay, we've almost run out of time. Last question before we go. Uh, you've got a, a bifurcation uh, ahead of you now. Uh, how are you up to the challenge of uh, splitting your own database into two different states? Yeah, I mean, we, it, it, it's been the easiest for us. I mean, there, there are other departments which have a bigger challenge. As far as IT is concerned, because it's all in the cloud, and you can, you can always, uh, uh, for example, MeSeva is going to become two MeSevas. One MeSeva will cater to Telangana, and one MeSeva will cater to Andhra Pradesh, effectively from 2nd of June. And uh, the databases uh, right now are going to be common databases, but they will be catering to both the states. And we have also put the entire software in cloud. And in fact, we are also replicating MeSeva in five more states, which uh, is for the mandate of the DIT. So our, our objective is that MeSeva can become a generic platform, and uh, uh, states can make use of it instead of reinventing the wheel. And that's where this question of replication comes in, because India, though, is a diverse country, but there are common set of, uh, except for the language part, there are common set of guidelines. Maybe a bit of tweaking may be required here and there, but possibly these kind of solutions can broadly be implemented across the country without, uh, you know, right. uh, too much of a change. Right, Sanjay, thank you so much for uh, joining us from uh, Hyderabad. Uh, or perhaps you are one of your last interviews uh, in the undivided state, and next time we speak to you, you'll be in one of the two states, and I wish you all the best for that, uh, Ayaz. Yeah, I think, look, he's got exciting times ahead. So <laughs> we'll just, we'll have to wait and see actually how the new government, uh, you know, takes up this challenge. I think one thing is clear, that the new prime minister is completely sold on technology. So, you know, e-governance yes, is going to become a fact of life. Right, right. And that's a good note to end on. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Sanjay, and thank you, Ayaz. Thanks. We're going to be back on the India Hangout very soon.